this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at a junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share and reuse what is available online and offline. The journey will take many stops. Interviewing, we're interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers, and we ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Professor Jean-Sébastien Coe. So Jean-Sébastien Coe is a professor in theoretical condensed matter physics. You'll have to explain me maybe in another time what that, is, what that exactly is <laughs> Jean uh, at the sure. University of Amsterdam. He's a Canadian citizen and he obtained his PhD in Oxford. He was a postdoctoral fellow in All Souls and moved to the Netherlands in 2003. Um, but besides his research activities, and that's mainly the reason why we're asking him uh, to be a guest on this podcast, he's actively involved in the reform of scientific publishing because he's the founder, implementer and current chairman of SciPost, which is an open access publication portal. Hi, welcome, Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's very nice to be here. So we, we've asked you here on the World Culture Podcast because as a researcher, you really have a unique insider view on the current scientific publishing landscape. Um, could you maybe uh, tell us a bit about the current state of play? And, and of course, um, uh, maybe if you could also elaborate a bit on the role copyright plays in this. Right. So maybe, maybe in general, I think it's quite an interesting moment for scientific publishing because uh, actually for, for a separate piece in Germany uh, about a year ago, I wrote a kind of parallel with evolutionary theory. There's a, there's a notion in evolution which is called punctuated equilibrium, which means that things are stable for sometimes very, very long times, but then suddenly go through moments where rapid transitions take place. And I think if you look at the history of scientific publishing, there are a few such events, you know, transitions over a few years where things go from one system to another. And I think we're really in the middle of such a period where uh, not only the uh, business model of publishing is changing, but also the stakeholders, the organizations that enforce it. And even there's talk a lot of changing the format of what is being published. So it's a discussion that goes at all levels. It goes at what you actually want to publish as a researcher, what you need to have access to as a researcher, uh, what kind of formats you've got associated to that, uh, how you uh, maybe curate that, how you improve the, the content, how you referee. Um, and then there comes the whole question of the, the, the ownership of this knowledge as well. And that's where, of course, copyright starts playing a very, very important role. So I think maybe one of the things which is changing a bit is indeed uh, who is allocated the copyright. There's a model which, I mean, certainly in physics, it used to be the case that it was uh, almost the only model around. Um, the copyright would be given to the organ organization actually publishing the research in the form of a paper. Yeah, it used to be printed, now just a PDF. And the copyright was essentially uh, just uh, signed away by the authors, by the scientists, to the publishing organization. Now, in many cases, that could be a professional society. In many cases, that's also like a corporate for-profit publisher that have, you know, inherently non-scientific interests um, at stake here. So, um, I mean, I think when the open access movement started gaining a bit of steam in the last couple of decades, one of the big things was maybe to consider... Um, giving back the control over their output to the scientists, to the authors. So uh, uh, this is not completely installed at the moment, but there's a lot of uh, uh, movement into that. And then, you know, you talk about the form of the license. You've got Creative Commons types licenses that are becoming more and more universally used here. The software industry has really pioneered, I think, the kind of more open licensing, but they're kind of different types of licenses than the ones you would use for PDFs of publications. Um, so I think in a sense, if you adopt a kind of platonic view as an academic for the question of copyright, it's very clear. As an academic, typically, uh, you're not seeking profit. You're not seeking to wall things in a certain thing. You're not trying to protect patents or anything like that. You really genuinely want your knowledge to be propagated as widely as possible throughout the world. Um, so uh, you, you, kind of, you, you would like to just give it away, really. Um, now, academics, of course, they have careers, they have essentially reputations associated to them that uh, open up doors. So there's a question of association of the content to the person who has produced it. 
And maybe that's why the convergence has been more towards a CC BY-like license these days, where indeed you can reuse everything in there. There are lots of rights associated to the actual material, provided you give good credit to the creators of this material and the holders of that, uh, that license. So, I mean, I think that's where we are now. And for the future, some interesting questions are what kinds of licensing, what kind of uh, copyright you'll want, you'll want to add to more complicated, for example, pieces of data, pieces of software, maybe contributions to pieces of software or, uh, uh, or things like that. But then the discussion becomes much more complicated. Maybe we'll get to it later on in the episode. <laughs> But, you know, uh. yes, it, <laughs> I'd like to go deeper a little bit into this open access movement, of course, uh, what, because basically the last decade this has turned scientific publishing upside down. We can we can say, or at least that's what that's the idea. Uh, could you tell us like what 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 should make open access more appealing to researchers uh, in comparison with traditional publishing, and 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 also maybe what could be done better in order to maybe to convince those who are not convinced uh, yet? And do you see any like major hurdles or speed bumps ahead? Yeah, so I mean, uh, certainly when I kind of hear you talking about hurdles and speed bumps, then I can draw a very, very wide, a very long list of, um, of such things. Um, I mean, I think um, uh, it's been it's been essentially quantitatively shown that um, published material, which is made openly accessible, uh, you know, typically through a CC through a CC by license or equivalent, it is actually much more used. Um, so, if I look at the workflow that I grew up uh, with when I was a young scientist, well, what did you do? You uh, 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 you know, when I was very young during my PhD, I actually went to the library <laughs> to read the journals, the physical printouts of the journals, uh, because that's where you would find the real like peer-reviewed version of things. And I used to spend hours and hours at the photocopying machine, just literally <laughs> photocopying the articles I was interested in and building my own, uh, my own library. So, um, uh, so if you want the... Um, uh, uh, the circulation then was quite difficult, quite limited. You had to be in an institution that did subscribe to all these journals. Sometimes in, in my field, for example, I needed a lot of uh, Russian papers and a lot of Japanese papers and many libraries that I used to, uh, to be at did not have subscription for these things. So then we had these little clubs of people sending papers by snail mail <laughs> um, uh, or, or email, you know, uh, 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 burgeoning at that point. So uh, the, the, the problem of accessibility has always been there. And I think maybe that's the greatest contribution of the open access movement is to try to remove this artificial barrier of accessibility. It's really a question about uh, making sure that people throughout the world, be they students in a university in a developing country or, you know, high level professors in a Western, you know, very rich university, that they are both unhindered in finding the material that they need. So, I mean, I think that's really the uh, uh, the great accomplishment of it. But it is by no means over, because now, although we have much more access to, uh, to lots of things, it's not true of everything we need for research. It's not true of all the papers that are published. It's not true, for example, of uh, also all the material that is used in the production of the science that is talked about in the papers. There's a kind of met, there's a meta question of accessibility, which then slots into this other concept, reproducibility. Ideally, in a kind of publication for, uh, for a paper, you should have all the elements required in order to be able to reproduce the research. That means if there are, you know, data sets being used or codes being run in order to achieve certain results, you should also have access to that, not just, you know, the PDF of the paper that says, oh, we did this and then we found that. Um, so, uh, so you see, um, I, I, in terms of speed bumps at hurdles, I think there's this developing problem about the meaning of access here. Access to what? To what level? <laughs> And uh, uh, there are great technical difficulties indeed in making the scientific content of the publications and everything associated, associated to those really accessible. You've got 
wonderful infrastructures like I don't know I think of uh, Zenodo. Uh, Zenodo is a great place you just dump your data set in there you dump your things you get a DOI it's made citable um, fantastic uh, 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 however is it curated what's it going to be like in 20 years are people going to still be using these things are we going a bit completely crazy the other way by trying to salvage and save absolutely everything we do because after all i think the great one of the great important tasks of a scientist is to cut through the bullshit and that means that maybe out of you know a uh, hundred things even you yourself produce you will deliberately keep only three and you will flush the rest because there's a notion of a kind of filtering and improvement so, so, you know, uh, uh, another hurdle that I foresee in the future is that these days it's become fashionable to say, no, no, you need to keep absolutely everything. You need to uh, uh, make sure that everything is reproducible and everything. So you store everything. Um, however, there's no um, nothing compelling you to properly curate it, to properly really pre-filter it. So there's a difficult equilibrium between you know, what you keep, what you don't keep. If you don't keep everything, are you curating or are you just deliberately obfuscating? Are you, make it, are you making it more easy or more difficult for the future in here? So, uh, yeah, people have different opinions on this. <laughs> but I'm kind of thinking that it's an interesting transitional time at the moment where people figure out exactly what you want to keep, <laughs> how, <laughs> uh, maybe some new standardizations for, for these things. But these are, you know, certainly speed bumps and hurdles. Yes. <laughs> Thank, thanks for clarifying also, but like the why why open access is, is important and what, what comes with it. Um, but of course, one of the reasons why we've asked you on this podcast is of course, because you're not you're not only a scientist trying to access information and producing information, you're also um, uh, yeah, the, the um, how shall I say, you've invented SciPost.org, which is a, a scientific publication portal, or, or even can I say publisher? You're, you're a publisher, yeah, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, um... <laughs> um, it's it's run with by professional scientists. Uh, it's and, and you're offering journals with top quality. And I have to repeat this, of course, peer reviewed, uh, referee refereeing, um, and 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 it's actually you don't charge subscription fees, but you also don't charge author fees. We're going to talk about these business models in the in a bit in the next question. But I, what I would like to know is. Like what motivated you to set up this grassroots solutions and, and what, what continues to drive you today? And, and do you feel that with SciPost, you're actually, um, let me call it, fill, are you filling in a gap that people, are you responding to a need that traditional publishers could not meet? Um, so uh, uh, I think so. Yes, I think there is a kind of need that was uh, addressed in there that uh, wasn't really, you know, maybe in the interests of the incumbents to, to address. So maybe just to, uh, to go back to the way you formulated the question, I think the one of the original motivations for this was very much to maybe ease the life of scientists a little bit, maybe to kind of uh, bring back some mental health into the publishing side of our of our jobs. Because um, I think it's just a fact that over the years, academics have lost control of the publishing side of their job. Why? Because, well, they, um, they don't control the structures that take all the decisions on these things. It's a little bit ironic, actually, because you've got people who are running huge research infrastructure, developing ultra complicated research projects, you know, really marvelous things coming out of, uh, 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 of the work, the daily work of academics, you know, the, 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 the senior people, uh, uh, the, the juniors there, the assistant professors, the tenure trackers, the postdocs, the PhD students who really, really work very focused on a certain number of things for a number of years. They produce marvels all over the place. But when comes the time to put these things on paper and tell them, you know, the, really communicate them out, suddenly lots of other polluting thoughts come to ruin the process. Um, because, well, okay, you think 
Um, I got to tell this story in a certain way so that it fits in a particular journal, because this particular journal, we know for a fact, if we have a, an article in that place, it will open up the door for the follow-up position of that particular postdoc in that particular place. It's going to facilitate the senior person's grant uh, 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 you know, harvesting activities. And you start telling stories, you start spinning stories. And so one of, one of the things that happened to me at some point is that in, in my group, we, we found something which I thought was really an absolutely fantastic new result, you know, be, like best in decade class uh, result. And I thought this is going to be so easy because we're going to write that up for one of the glossy magazines and they're going to lap it up because it's so important, yeah, clearly. So then, you know, I'm a theorist, so it's full of equations, you know, fairly technical and whatnot. And we sent that to the glossy and they essentially wrote back saying, you know, are you joking? <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> so we said, okay, uh, uh, we, we went to another journal and then we sent that in and, and, and they said, you know, you must be joking. Yeah? This is like too complicated. It doesn't sell. Yeah, yeah we're, we're selling magazines. <laughs> no. <laughs> so we just tumbled from one place to another and each time we had to rewrite the whole article in the style of this different publishing venue. And at some point, I really blew my fuse because I computed that we had spent more time writing and revising the article than the time we had spent on the original research. And I told myself, never again, never again. This is, the, this is a total waste of time. Uh, my ideal as a scientist, as an academic, is that I tell things as they are. I don't feel I need to, you know, uh, spin a big story or convince some, you know, editor in a field totally disconnected from my field that this is maybe going to sell some muffins for their company and bring in something for the, you know, the baseline uh, financial result at the end of the year. This this has got nothing to do with the science. So I, um, uh, I was complaining quite bitterly about that, quite vocally about that, and. Uh, I was looking at the requirements for running an infrastructure with publishing because I was keeping hearing things that, oh, yeah, but you need the publishers. Yeah, they bring added value to this whole thing. And, you know, I was a bit ticked off by that. I say, well, OK, what value do you bring? How complicated is it really to run a publishing system? And quite frankly, as an academic, uh, uh, how complicated is it as compared to what we academics do on a daily basis? And then you just realize it's a total joke. Come on. It's much simpler to run a publishing thing than to do the actual research. So, okay, let's do it ourselves. Let's just do it. And, you know, just did. <laughs> so learned about uh, all the systems, the metadata, and almost as a challenge, started coding the whole thing in my armchair at home. Uh, just to see if it worked. And it kind of worked, and I learned by doing it that actually the publishers were really not doing such a good job at all, despite what they were saying. Uh, you know, their metadata is totally disastrous. Uh, uh, you know, their, their refereeing protocols, they're absolutely full of influential steps that actually really prefer financial results over, uh, over academic integrity and things like that. And I thought, you know, you, you, you got to move out of this. You, you got to move the business out of this. And my vision for SciPost was really to just build a machine that would enable scientists to kind of seamlessly run through the steps that they needed in order to get the publishable object at the end. And then that's it. Yeah? Not, uh, uh, not be polluted by other non-academic considerations. That was really the, uh, the motivation and why I think grassroots is a very important concept for SciPost. I, I really want it to be run by people whose lives are affected by the publishing activities, you know, not people who are trying to gain other forms of profit. Yeah, so that's, uh, th that is still what continues driving me today as well, because the situation has not changed. And I think uh, it's an important thing to do. I, I do. I would like to go back a little bit to the business aspect of, of the case sure. because I think it's important. I mean, it's relevant for even for non-commercial uh, commercial publishing uh, endeavors like yeah. yours. Um, so, a lot of publishers who are offering an open access solution or option charge uh, author fees um, to 
fund their workings uh, in some cases like overfund their workings you could say but that is a common very common practice in open access publishing um, but you at SciPos, you, you really you don't do this you don't charge uh, authors for uh, for the any work that that's being done um, on the publishing side um, but so that that leads me to the question like what is your business model and 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 um, by that mainly I mean how do you ensure the long-term sustainability of SciPost? So uh, uh, we have a kind of, um, you know, uh, I would say um, uh, morally very um, uh, commendable model, but on the business side, totally suicidal mm -hmm. uh, model. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because um, so the, the first maybe vulnerability that I would identify in the very, very popular like article processing charge based system that we have now uh, or at least that is, you know, gaining immensely in popularity uh, as we speak. Um, it's that you you do tie um, financial matters with editorial matters. It is essentially um, uh, a fact that there exist many predatory open access publishers who, you know, willfully charge APCs to uh, to the authors, disregarding a bit the negative APCs reports on the side. Yeah. At uh, the article processing APCs charges, being article processing charges, yep. Which are the uh, 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 the uh, the costs that the authors themselves pay to the publishers in order to have their work made open access. So this a really funny exercise as a scientist like this working in uh, uh, you know working in academia and dealing with this is to try to explain to your neighbor in the business world how the business model of APCs works and they kind of go no 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 you got it wrong yeah so they try to tell you no no you got it. you're the client you pay you dictate what you want yeah it's like you know <laughs> it's the way it works these trying, there's the seller there's the buyer and we say no 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 <laughs> in academia we do all the work but yeah we pay out <laughs> the business people just can't get it <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense but in academia it makes sense because essentially of the fact that it is it is not a market yeah you you can't you can't change anything the the lives of the scientists are really linked to their publishing activities so there's a lot of pressure a lot of incentive for scientists and academics to do do whatever it takes to get their paper. And if they're asked to pay, they're gonna to try to, to do it one way or another. So um, so the APC model, of course, was developed by the incumbent publishers as a replacement for the subscription model uh, because it is so convenient for the publishers. Uh, uh, you know, the, the person who's got the, uh, the best incentive for having the paper published is the author of the paper. <laughs> so therefore is the most uh, susceptible to, you know, pressurization and being convinced to indeed like, uh, 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 be defrauded of money in order for, for these things to happen. So, um, uh, so, so that model is something which I personally was vociferously against. Um, for all the damage that it does to uh, to, to academics, uh, but also for you know the damage it does to the editorial process because of this pollution, this linking between the editorial and the financial. I think the the, the quality of refereeing and the neutrality of it really is damaged. Yeah, it's really polluted by that thing. I, um, I, I kind of call uh, publishers, I, I like, I, I've got this kind of full metal classification of, uh, uh, of publishers and things. And for me, a publisher that links these things together is a publisher suffering from lead pollution. Uh, there's lead in their, uh, in their gas. Um, so, uh, so I wanted Cypos to have a total decoupling between editorial and financial, and therefore, um, uh, uh, that meant that the sustainability of the initiative had to be guaranteed by the organizations benefiting from the activities of SciPost. And then you ask yourself, yeah, which organizations benefit from the existence of SciPost and the activities of SciPost? Well, of course, the universities who employ the scientists who publish with SciPost, the funding agencies who fund the projects that these scientists are running, because otherwise these universities and funding agencies would ultimately have to pay directly or indirectly APCs to the other publishers. So, um, so if you just look at the overall flow of money, 
uh, uh, it would be much better for these institutions to ensure the sustainability of SIPOST, thereby reducing the overall expenditure on the publishing side. So, so here's where the suicidal business model of SIPOST comes, uh, because we say, no, no, we are academics. We run the publishing. We run the decision making. We run the actual, you know, uh, uh, publishing moment, metadata, metadata deposition, absolutely everything. We're not saying that this is free. This does cost something. However, we view this as part of the academic infrastructure, and we would expect universities worldwide to pool resources into a pot that we can draw from in order to operate without linking things down to the, you know, cent level. So, so the idea is that we look at our publishing activities and then for each year, we can tell to a given institution that they were associated to that many papers with that many authors and this, all, all these distributions that you have, everything. And then we know the total cost of our operation. So we can give a ballpark estimate for the cost per paper that we have for running our operations. And then we just beg for money to these institutions, more or less in relationship to the amount of use they make of our services. But it's not an invoice that we send. It's not a, a big kind of hard invoice with a deadline with punishment uh, if they don't pay by that. Uh, they're like donations, yeah, because SciPost is in the end a charity. <laughs> Uh, it's not a profit-making organization. It's literally uh, registered as a charity. Um, so, so, so this is the great challenge that we have to demonstrate our worth sufficiently to the academic institutions that they feel morally compelled to make sure we don't disappear. <laughs> but yeah, a very bad business model if you're trying to get a loan from a bank. Yeah? Uh, apart from, from buying your time, what can your institution, what can institutions do more and, and what can policymakers do more to encourage or to make this global shift towards open access a reality? So I think I think institutions really need to look, take a very, very hard look at how they spend their money because um, uh, actually there were uh, there were discussions even recently, even uh, you know on Twitter uh, earlier today and things uh, linked to some blogs talking about indeed how libraries, academic libraries worldwide, uh, should look at their budget and should prioritize their budget because. Um, I think the current situation is that everything is totally fragmented. Um, uh, universities essentially negotiate with the incumbent publishers, you know, almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Sometimes in some groupings, but they come they come up with these transitional agreements, these big agreements here and that compensation schemes for APCs and whatnot. Uh, and all these new schemes, they're kind of designed by the corporate publishers to deplete the available budgets of the libraries because they know very well how much money there is in those things. And they're just going to ask for 20% more, make sure that they suck everything up. Um, uh, so that means that in the whole cacophony of negotiations for payments for publishing services, there's a whole sector which is totally neglected, which is, you know, in a first approximation, let's call it the diamond open access sector. That means essentially academics, more or less well organized on, you know, more or less big scale, using very few resources to give a service which is of, uh, sometimes extremely high quality, but not, you know, knocking on the door, not employing armies of full-time lobbyists, whining and dining decision makers high up in university administration and funder uh, agency administration in order to sign, thing, uh, to sign valuable contracts. So um, I think if academic institutions worldwide were more street smart, better synchronized with each other, better aware of how they are being systematically outsmarted by corporate publishers, then maybe these organizations could form a kind of big consortium saying, you know what, there's this whole sector out there, Diamond OA, and it is our moral responsibility as supporters of the fundamentals of you know, research production facilities and people throughout the world, we will make these initiatives sustainable because we know very well that economically, 
if we if we try to justify it morally, we're already done, you know, case closed. But we can even justify it on pure pecuniary criteria. We can absolutely demonstrate that over a period of five years, we will realize massive economies if this diamond sector is able to grow to you know, occupy a substantial fraction of the publishing activities. So this is the single most important thing that academic institutions could do. Just uh, get their act together, uh, be smarter, <laughs> organize a proper sustainable funding structure for scholar-led uh, publishing activities. It is entirely possible. But the problem is that this takes brain space, this takes initiative, and this takes also coordination. And unfortunately, universities throughout the world are more likely to compete with each other than collaborate with each other. In a sense, you, you see a bit this disaster with the, uh, the preprint repositories everywhere or you know such local repositories. Everything becomes local because this university wants to have its own initiative with its own brand name onto it. But then the other university also wants one of these things. So they start their own, th their own system. It's all completely fragmented, completely balkanized, which means that as far as a world level, world caliber scientist is concerned, it is utterly useless. <laughs> unusable and therefore useless. So there needs to be this coordination, there needs to be this kind of UNESCO style thinking at the academic level to say that resources will be redirected in this more promising direction of the diamond OA sector at the detriment of the for-profit uh, publishers. It's just, it has to be an institutional decision. They are after all the clients in this whole business and, you know, to my great irritation, they don't act as clients. <laughs> they act as essentially, you know, it's a bit as if they were run by the mafia or something. They feel like they need to pay the mafia boss on the side, but it doesn't need to be like that. Yeah. So I would challenge the university administrations everywhere to get their act together on this, because what I've seen over the last few years has been admittedly excessively disappointing. I think this, this leads very nicely into one of the questions I ask all my guests here on the show, and that is what should 2030 look like? So you made a very convincing plea for more diamond open access and for more researcher -led pub publishing initiatives. But what, what I'm wondering is, um, where does copyright come into play? Do you, say, do you think we need a major shift on that on that front as well, like so how researchers view copyrights uh, and how this could influence um, or how this can increase uh, access to knowledge, a change in their and their views on it. Um, so I think I think copyright is an interesting instrument in this very very it's, it's a very interesting pawn right in this complicated chess game uh, uh, of uh, of the reform of publishing. I think. You see, you see some interesting developments uh, appearing. So, for example, at the moment, there's a lot of talk about the rights retention strategy, whereby, uh, whereby authors essentially can say that it doesn't matter what the uh, rules about copyright ownership are at the publisher, they will retain their rights anyway. They just tell that to the publisher from beforehand, and then they can deposit their uh, uh, either author accepted manuscript or published manuscript in various repositories from which other people can can then get it. So that's, I think that's an interesting development in the um, uh, on the side of uh, on the side of copyright. What I what I in a sense would prefer um, uh, is for the researchers themselves, the academics themselves, to just say enough is enough. We just all agree with each other worldwide, all academics. That from this day onward, yeah, from today onwards, we're not giving away our copyright anymore. That's it. Nobody's doing it. And uh, if publishers don't adapt to this new reality, then it's their problem. They're entirely able to adapt within, you know, just one day. Publishers they say it's technically complicated. You know, it's it's all bullshit. 
they could they could really accommodate um, uh, uh, author retained copyright copyright without any problem. It's really a question of preserving their business <laughs> uh, uh, for things. So so I think as far as publishing is concerned, um, it would require academics to take this unilateral decision, universal, and, uh, and to make it happen. But that's not going to happen because of the collective action problem. They're just not going to. So maybe maybe then academic institutions should say, no, no, we, on behalf of all our academics, say that from this point onwards, all academics at our university are going to retain copyright. And that's just non-negotiable. Yeah, it's just the way it's going to be. It's just the way it's going to be. We're not asking you whether it's possible. We are telling you that this is going to be the requirement. And we will only work with publishers that fulfill this requirement. Um, but, uh, but unfortunately, and here's probably an opening for yet another series that you could make next year, the world is changing because indeed publishing the paper itself becomes only a very small part of things. We need to talk about data. We need to talk about code. And most importantly, and this is something that very few people are aware of, uh, incumbent publishers, especially the larger scale ones, have transformed into massive surveillance operations on the operations of you know everything that uh, academia does. So you have lots of evaluation systems, lots of um, you know uh, internal data management and you know orchestration systems that are now being essentially run by the newer side of these uh, of these organizations. So although publishing itself might become completely open access, fine with uh, copyright owned by authors in, uh, in five or 10 years or something like that, what's going to happen is that inside your university, all your IT infrastructure, the management, where you store your data, how you store the stuff, how, how the performance of people is evaluated and whatnot, it's going to be run by the organizations that used to do publishing. And you see very worrying developments now. So, so one of the one of the absolutely unacceptable developments, for example, are these uh, PDFs, for example, <laughs> that contain surveillance style um, uh, uh, extra internal gizmos that inform the publisher who opens it. And if you circulate it to your friend somewhere, then the publisher will know about this. So um, this opens up a big can of worms. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, uh, although copyright uh, uh, can be a solved problem for uh, for publishing, the notion of the ownership of the meta information associated to all of this is not traditionally kind of held by copyright at the authors or whatnot. These things go into something else. So you know, maybe that's the question. So so who owns the copyright to the data and the database? that is created by the surveillance operations on all academics worldwide with these tagged PDFs and whatnot. Well, then you can ask certain companies uh, who owns this data. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> so that's the new valuable ownership that is developing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's like you say, that's an entire can of worms that we which maybe should keep for a different, uh, for a different series. So it's, of course, it's a very, yeah, it's a very crucial aspect of even these discussions that we're having right now here. And it's a, um, it's a worrying trend with in view of yeah. current developments. It's a very worrying trend. Yeah. I'm going to um, I'm going to ask you a question that I've um, that I've asked all my guests here as well. Is that so? We, we this interview disappears on a blog called World Culture, and and what I would like to know from you is, is there a a particular specific moment when you hit that wall and, and you thought there's something wrong here? Like what, when was the first time that you really realized that uh, academic publishing was not working for you? Um, actually, so, so, so earlier I was mention, mentioning this, um, this example of this research project, right, on which we had spent more time rewriting the paper and things. And of course that meant uh, a lot of cycles of refereeing behind closed doors with uh, uh, sometimes report contents that we could very easily kind of uh, ad address, but the report was kind of saying, oh, it's not kind of important enough for that journal, or it doesn't fit with the kind, of, it's, it's not like sellable enough uh, and this and that. And um, I felt very much uh, at that point that I was hitting a wall of um, 
not being able to communicate this thing further. You see, we were the authors, the ultra specialists in that thing. The referee was, of course, you know, also extremely knowledgeable in that thing. But the editor taking the decision was manifestly unqualified to understand the technical thing. And the editorial decision was based on this kind of, you know, uh, 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 cat and mouse play, or not cat and mouse play, but really like, uh, you know, bullfight <laughs> between authors and, and referees. And you see a fight, you say, no, no, I don't want that. And I thought, why is this behind closed doors? Why is there a wall surrounding all this refereeing activity? And why is this content all not accessible? So, so that's why, for example, for Sidepost, I really chose to go for open refereeing. The, the, the contents of the reports are accessible and visible to the rest of the community because I wanted to break down that wall of the kind of secret editorial decision behind closed doors based on referees that no, on referee reports that nobody else sees. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's maybe, you know, one of the walls which uh, I was trying to, uh, 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 to address after hitting it. <laughs> Yeah, um, but that's very personal. Yeah, so it's uh, 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 open refereeing, of course, comes with its own um, added features and pressures, but uh, lack of openness and walling in of information is not one mm -hmm. of them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this very uh, fruitful interview i thought it was very very interesting um is there anything you'd like to say or would you would like to add to our conversation um Any i mean i think we have discussed yeah maybe what i would what i would like to say is that so on the on the one hand i i really would like to like free academics from thinking about all these things that have got nothing to do with their academic work. I would, I would so love it if quantum physicists could really think about quantum physics the whole time, if mathematicians could just really think about mathematics the whole time, uh, and if academics were freed from thinking about, you know, questions of copyright law, uh, maybe ownership of infrastructure, uh, uh, financial dealings here and there, I would like them to not spend too much time on this. But on the other hand, I don't want them to be ill-informed about this. I would like them to be, you know, knowledgeable about these things. So, so I do think it's important that people understand the, the meaning and importance and variety of forms of copyright as far as publishing is concerned and as far as the, uh, the future is concerned as well. So I would really like to encourage my fellow academics to maybe one afternoon when they're truly bored, just dive in and go and look how it works. Go look how copyright works, how it's applied in various places, what it means uh, uh, on the long term for academic content. Look at the business models of the organizations that you're dealing with. It doesn't have to take weeks and weeks in one afternoon or in an hour. You already have a very, very good idea of what, uh, uh, what happens. And although you don't spend your life on it, let it maybe alter your priorities and your behavior in order to facilitate this kind of transition to a better system overall. Mm -hmm. uh, usually a bit of information can easily turn you into a bit more of an activist. And sometimes if you know too much, then you become really an activist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So people trying to keep you in the dark, uh, there might be a reason for this. So try to just mm -hmm. open it up a bit. Great. Well, with these closing words, uh, Jean-Sébastien, Jean I really want to thank you for this very insightful interview. Uh, and thank I, you. I think My our pleasure. listeners will also have really enjoyed it. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.